actually holding the camera. Uh, that's my voice while we're while we're watching that video. I mean, you hear my voice crack at the end. So uh, that's how excited I was about that when I when I watch that video now. You know, it's posted a lot in different threads, especially amongst more casual players talking about the joy of Street Fighter. Um, it still gets me. Like it still gets me every time. That moment actually didn't almost happen because we almost ran out of footage and battery the second before that happened. So um, literally the battery ran out as soon as that match ended and we panned the crowd and we panned back and then the battery died. It made history happen and it made the community, it made the community stronger seeing stuff like that. No matter how far the chips are down, you know, if you've got the, the skill and the mental acumen and prediction to, to know what's coming next, you can get out of any situation. So that moment encapsulates Street Fighter. And I see, you know, so many millions of people have watched that clip and I thought to myself like, how many of them could possibly understand really the technique and the, the skill involved in what was happening in this, this parry? I, I can't, I gotta think it's way less than 1%. So Street Fighter 1 came out in 1987. I remember seeing it in the arcades and was just like, this game is stupid. It was kind of an interesting concept, but it's just sort of crummy. And then I remember seeing Street Fighter 2, and it took me actually years to even realize Street Fighter 2 was connected to Street Fighter 1. Because Street Fighter 2 was such a, you know, made the jump to light speed completely. Uh, and not only defined mechanics that would come for years later, but also was just sort of this, you know, like intoxicating stew of things, where there were these mysterious moves and characters, and you know, sometimes there were these special moves that would come out, and there were six buttons, which was just like totally overwhelming for a game at the time, and it was just filled with mystery, but also soaked in this air of competition. Round one. Fight. You know, the arcade business had been sort of on its heels for a while, and Street Fighter Two really revitalized it where it wasn't just an interesting computer opponent, but you're playing against another person. You know, just like a Kung Fu movie, there were like guys at the arcade, like, this guy has this trick and plays this this character, and this guy's the best, and you know, this is the, you know, the master, and you gotta take him down. So, I mean, the, the, the game really mirrored exactly what was happening there in the ar arcade environment. Um, just about, you know, seeing these older guys who were, you know, some tough looking characters, and I could take them down and send them to the back of the line, and. Maybe they'd get mad and hit me, but probably not. Generally, it was pretty cool, and uh, that was just, it was a total thrill ride. Street Fighter II was already a difficult, mysterious game for many people. Basically, every iteration of Street Fighter since then raised the bar. So it assumed you knew sort of what to do before and built on that to challenge the core players who'd been playing the whole time. But that kept the player base shrinking and shrinking. It was very difficult for new players to jump in because they were asked to learn so much stuff that the previous generation had already figured out. So by the time Street Fighter III Third Strike came out, it was a great game, but it was such a tiny pool of players, it wasn't able to be a success, and Capcom sort of, at that point, almost threw in the towel on our arcade fighters. So they, they had some other directions going with some of the Versus games that were more successful, but as far as Street Fighter, that was pretty much the end uh, up until Street Fighter IV. So visually, we're going to push it to the next level. But conceptually, as far as game design, we're going to stay at our core competency and what really, you know, Street Fighter II didn't just kick off the fighting craze, it defined a genre. Like, there weren't other games like that, really. I mean, there's, you know, there you can make arguments that, oh, this game had something like, but come on, it was Street Fighter II the whole way, um, completely defined the genre. So we went right back there for Street Fighter IV, said this is, this is the thing that we made that was amazing, that set the world on fire. We're gonna push the reset button, go back here, but we didn't wanna um, try and reinvent the wheel. We wanted to try and remind people about what made the wheel so great. <laughs> ready for it. Like the, the, whole, the idea behind the games had never gotten old. It's just become too difficult to get into them. So by going back to the basics, I think we really opened the door and reminded people what was cool about these games and, and made a game that wasn't going to be uh, abusive uh, um, as far as people, people getting in the door. And getting in the door.
what's the difference between a casual player and more of a tournament player? Mental health? My name is Justin Wong. Um, I do, I guess, a couple things. One, I guess during the day, uh, you can say that I am a community representative for a video game company called Nexon. But at night, I am this awesome pro gamer superhero for Evil Geniuses. I've never played, like, before Justin moved out here, I never really played him much, right? And then when he started living here and I sat down with him and played him for a while, you know, it kind of immediately dawned on me why he was, like, different than everybody else. It's just when you play him, it just it starts to feel like he's psychic. Like, really, it starts to feel like he's psychic. And so, whenever I do commentary on one of his matches, like, it's a lot of times it's just like, I'm just as dumbfounded as anybody else. Pro gaming, I think just more or less came about from, you know, gaming being my hobby. I started traveling with gaming by myself, you know, on my own budget because I wanted to get out and about and experience what foreign competition was like. So I was once invited to Japan for a world championship on a game called Urgaif and uh, I, I qualified for a world finals in, in, in Tokyo, which I actually at the time never thought I'd ever get to go to and never thought I'd ever get to see Japan. You know, it was like this little dream of a teenage gamer, wow, I'll go to Japan, you know. So that sort of sparked my sort of traveling quest of going to different countries and stuff. Once I went to Japan, I realized, hey, I can actually travel around and um, meet new gamers and play new games, experience new types of competition. Like for me, Street Fighter 4, it's the IP, you know, it's the, it's, everyone's grown up on these characters. Um, you know, characters like Ryu and Ken are almost as well known as characters like Batman and Spider-Man, do you know what I mean? Like, everyone knows them. And we see this here at HMV, when people walk past, you know, they look at the screens and they know exactly, oh yeah, that's Street Fighter. Um, so, automatically you've got a huge player base. And, you know, players like Ryan, they go to where the competition is. They're all about the competition. And Street Fighter 4 at the moment is just the biggest game by a mile. Um, the competitive scene in the UK uh, has grown uh, quite quickly in Street Fighter, um, with, you know, from Street Fighter 4. Before Street Fighter, um, it, I had an Xbox. So I've, I've been playing like uh, all of different games like Call of Duty and my friends will like invite me to play Call of Duty and whatnot and like, I'll play it but um, it's, it's never had me like engaged or like uh, had me practicing that much and when I play Street Fighter I feel in some way it is endless. There are other fighting games that are a lot more technical than the latest Street Fighter games but Street Fighter being what it is is the one fighting game franchise that sort of brings all the fighting game communities together. It's quite an underground sort of industry, isn't it? You know, it's, if you're not involved yourself, you might not even have heard about an esports athlete. You know, what is a pro gamer? You might not really know what that means. So, I think they have. So for them, it's just like a couple of guys pressing buttons and you know fighting with two guys on the screen. But they won't understand the intricacies of, of what's going down in that match. You know that there's actually psychology involved, and there's a, a you know hand-eye coordination, re reaction speed, and things like that. There's all these really technical things that you know can relate to almost any sport. 
that's accepted on TV. And they put so much time and effort into practicing and training. You know, as with anything, as with any sport, it's because really it, it, it's the same dedication you get for a professional sport. Like, I've probably spent more time playing this because I used to play football. Like I had football like every Sunday, and like uh, I'll practice football, right? But not to like this extent. Uh, so right now in the tournament we're at the um, losers semi-final stage. I, I won the winners final so now I'm in the grand final and I just basically have to wait for the winner of the remaining matches which is the losers um, semi to play and then the losers final after that and then I'll, get, I'll have to face the winner of that match in the grand finals. Um, as it's a double elimination bracket, the person that um, wins to come through to the grand finals with me will have to win two sets, whereas I only have to win one because I'm in winners. So I'll have a slight advantage in that area and hopefully that will, be, uh, that will work out well for me. So uh, um, I think I've been playing mediocre to be honest. I don't think I've been playing tight at all. I've uh, dropped a few links, um, yeah, you know, some not necessarily worthwhile guesses I've been going for but I've been having fun and maybe that's the problem really I'm having too much fun I should try and take it a bit more seriously because I do have Evo coming up and people are going to be playing seriously and it's going to be one chance you know that one chance you get is going to be might, might only might be your only chance so I should really be using these tournaments as practice for that and not trying to be flashy or do the best combo or win in the stylish way um, so we'll see but I mean yeah I, I will try to um, try and play as seriously as possible in the grand finals and hopefully that can mark the start of my training for Evo. Uh, Evolution is the biggest fighting game term in the world. Uh, people from 30 countries come out and they it come to a convention type setting where you get to play beta test games, you get to compete the best tournament in the world, you get to go to panels, you get to have a great time, see what, stay, with, stay with your friends and just play games what people in the fighting community love to do. You could kind of say that EVO is like the WrestleMania in wrestling or the Super Bowl, you know, with NFL. You could say it's like the grandest stage of all the fighting game tournaments that you have. So Evolution is really just a big double elimination bracket. It's uh, double elimination means it's you you can lose once and then you end up going to the loser's bracket where you play other losers and you get one more chance to lose before you're knocked out of the tournament. So basically you get two chances to win all the way to the top to collect the prize money, but if you get knocked out anywhere on the way, you're you're done. Evo managed to grow every every year as it went on. So every year was bigger than the last year, every year was a little better than the last year. We've grown uh, probably double the amount of players each year for the past 10 years. Evo began as something else. Different people date it differently. So uh, I've known uh, the founder of Evo for, I don't know, somewhere between 15 and 20 years, uh, Tom Cannon. Um, I met him a long, long time ago on the internet, and then we finally met up in an arcade, and I remember going like, hey, wow, this guy's black. Like, we had no idea, because the internet was so bad back then. We organized an event in a, a New York City Broadway arcade, just, um, you know, about 32 of uh, strong players from the area all came in together. My first evil was before it was called evil. It was called the B-Series. So Tom went on to do a proper tournament called Battle by the Bay, uh, or B3, which brought in 64 people, I think, from around the, well, I should say around the world. There were mostly from California, a few stragglers from outside, uh, I believe someone from Mexico, and a couple of Kuwaitis. Um, but the Kuwaitis were really exciting because it was like, wait, guys from Kuwait came over for, the, for this? Really? And it's just, it was just, you know, in uh, Golfland Arcade. Welcome to Sunnyvale Golfland and the home of this year's B3. Uh, but it was exciting and it was thrilling and just sort of the having that structure and that format around it, like this is the tournament. Like we all play and we all kind of know who's the best, but this tournament is like sort of a crystallized chance to show what you're made of. <laughs> Ricky Furby playing dress up with Justin. Yeah, two glitter, two glitter. Furby, yeah, what, what's, two glitter. what's your assist, dude? What are you coming in to do? Hey, hey, hey like, Furby. hey, I use a glitter assist in Alpha 3, right? Glitter assist? What? Yes. Big blow from Derek Daniels. And uh, took a bunch of different permutations, but the B name became increasingly strained because it stopped referring to really anything 
by B4 and B5. So um, in the early 2000s, uh, I switched the name to the Evo or Evolution Tournament. And uh, yeah, that's just grown every year. Adding some new games, adding some new players, and eventually we ended up in Las Vegas where it's just out of control now, where thousands and thousands of players and it's just out of control. Then you started to get more international players. Then guys from Japan started coming over and it just sort of kept steamrolling. Um, and there was such a great feeling in the room between everybody. And again, this really deep shared bond of, I hate you, I gotta beat you down, and then sort of this grudging respect that you, you earn um, through that kind of active engagement. You are Kuni Funada. Yes. Uh, one of the managers of the Japanese team and also uh, an impressive player here today. Nice Alpha 3 showing. I think these international competitions will be uh, very common in the future. A wave of the future. Yes. There's always tournaments that I love going to every year. Like, for example, season beatings or final round. But if I have to always choose one tournament of the year to go to, EVO would always be the tournament to go to. It's just because all my friends go there. It's really hard to win there, and also, if you win, you're the world champion. It just kept people coming back, and it gave them, uh, you know, a real sense of belonging. That's where, if you ever want to win a big tournament, that's the tournament to win, because everyone will blow it up. EVO has grown very large on hype, you know, people have really supported the event well, and now it's just known as the event to be at. Hype is a concept that can't be like, you can't buy hype, you can't... Yeah, you can only just prepare the, the, the tournament or prepare whatever you're going to do and just hope for the best. And you can't, you can't produce it. Like, you can't say, oh, this is going to be hype, because it might not be hype. You just have to put the best possible scenario for hype to happen, and then it happens. What's, I think, great about it and kept people coming back is they, there's a sense of ownership there um, for everybody involved and uh, a real sense of history and pride. Like, we built this. Like we hold a 95% retention rate. If you come to Evo, you come back. And so it's like cocaine that way. Once you have a little taste of cocaine, you always want more and more. It was something that the players made themselves and made it, made it their way and into a really uh, beautiful thing. Uh, well, today is a qualifier for um, a trip to go to Japan um, for the biggest tournament in Japan called Super Battle Opera. And uh, it's a team tournament which involves Super Street Fighter 4 Arcade Edition. And um, only, of course, since we're in America, it's a West Coast qualifier, it's a West Coast block qualifier. So only Americans from can win for the past one. What that is, player A1 versus player B1, right? Whoever wins. No matter what, the next row of players plays, so it's not Pokemon style. Player A1 plays player B1, and then regardless of who wins, the other two play. So it's not like Pokemon style, one guy wins and he stays on, everybody gets to play. So it's, uh, it's a little more brutal. You get to see the entire team play instead of just getting one player to wipe the other guys out. We got a lot of veterans here today. We got uh, um, some new teams, uh, Team Complexity. We have two two versions of them. We have one with Combo Queen and Gutex, and the other one with uh, Mike Ross, the Filipino champ. We got Team EG uh, with uh, Ricky Ortiz and um, Flo. Um, I know Justin's here, and he's pretty much saving his team. He doesn't want to announce it yet, but he's he's here. A lot of other great faces too. A lot of powerhouses, and of course, uh, some guys from Arizona, Latif. Uh, he's a favorite, actually. He plays top eight in Revelations. Uh, best Viper player in the West Coast. And he's teaming up with Mr. SNK, really good Honda player. I, I expect nothing but from the best, you know, nothing but the best from these guys. Uh, I play with them, and I expect, like, just a lot of uh, serious, serious in gameplay. Hi, everybody. My name is Michael Q. I am a event coordinator at Round One USA. Let me first off and start off by saying, like, uh, working with uh, Alex Valle and Level Up, uh, team, uh, I knew it was going to be like a match made in heaven because after last year's SPO, uh, we, I really wanted to make a rebound and making it a really big scene for the fighting game community um, because last year it wasn't such a big draw and I know SPO draws in, especially in the United States, a big crowd and when, since I've been here at round one, I've made it my personal goal to give the community 
what they want. During the recession here in the United States, the one main thing that wasn't hurt or affected as much was the gaming industry. And I could see that the only thing that really hurt was the arcade scene because obviously the console scene opened up. So everyone was playing online, hey, come on Xbox, come on PSN. A few arcades have taken a large hit, uh, like Family Fun Arcade has you know, already started to shut down. How can we bring back the community? How can we bring back this, this atmosphere? And uh, like, of course, bringing back top games, having SBO at the arcade, something that people can look forward to when they go out. So instead of going out on Saturdays and maybe watching a movie, they can say, hey, I think Justin's playing at round one. Let's go, let's go see what's up. There's, there's a lot of killers out there that uh, even I'm like very hard. I really don't want to take sides. I mean, I've always supported like Justin and Marn and Ricky. I've known those guys uh, as well. And those guys really, really lay it out there when I was growing up. And you know, Justin was untouchable. But now like right now, there's so many people killing for Justin and then wanting to play the Japanese players that are coming out for EVO. I mean, it's anyone's game at this point. Me and Mike were really friendly, you know, I, we hang out like just outside of video games and stuff. So, but like, you know, when it comes to like, I guess the online world of social media networks, people think that we're enemies and stuff, which is pretty funny. I don't see why they, they, would, they would think that, but I can totally see why, because it's just friendly shit talking here and there. This is going to sound maybe weird, I don't know, but I think my inspiration for continuing to do great is for just a long because Justin Wong is, you know, he's the best U.S. player. Uh, I'm not necessarily trying to take that title, but I just always want to prove him wrong. <laughs> Whenever he says some kind of stat about the game, I want to prove him wrong and show that I can just beat him. That's all I care about. So, you know, me and Mike, we have this joke saying that, you know, like we call each other both frauds, right? But I call him a fraud because like, oh, you know, he plays Honda and he keeps saying that, no, this character beats Honda all the time. And I'm like, you are totally full of crap right now because you clearly know how overpowered your character is. I'll admit that my character needs nerfs. But Mike, he's like, no, don't, he needs buffs all the time. That's why I call him a fraud. Like he runs his mouth more than anybody else. He looks silent and innocent. He plays a game and just goes back home and you guys think he's quiet, but the first thing he does is he sends me text messages, he calls me on the phone and he harasses me on Facebook and nobody knows this and I'm trying to silence him. So a lot of people, they have this belief that character loyalty is like the, like the thing that you should follow in life. I understand where Japan comes from where they only want to play one character to master that character or they want to be known to that character, but in America, since there is prize money involved, because Japan doesn't have prize money in their tournaments, yeah, it's illegal. Like game, tournaments with money in Japan is illegal. So they only win, they, that's, they only play for pride. That is why I think they're so good. But in America, you know, we're we're, we're some greedy ass people here. <laughs> Not gonna lie. So we're gonna try to do what we what it takes to win. I don't see why people think if you can play two characters, three characters, four characters. How come, wouldn't that make you better than just knowing how to play as one character, you know what I mean? So, in my opinion, I just think that fact that like people that stick with their original characters, sometimes it doesn't really work on their favor. They're just doing it because that's what the stream wants, that's what the people want. But, you know, you're playing for yourself. When did it become a popularity contest? Like, Justin's playing Yun today, and he's fucking around because he doesn't play the game. Because he doesn't like the game. I don't like the game, but I feel like I have to play it, even though I don't like it. Normally, I like playing games. It's one of my passion to play games. But if I don't like something, it's really hard for me to, to like, push myself to practice. Normally, my friends would not have to tell me, like, hey, Ryan, you should go play AE. Come on, you got to practice. Nobody has to tell me that. Now they have to, because I don't like the game. It's just really bad but I feel like even if I don't play the game and somebody beats me some random average Joe beats me he's still gonna celebrate as if like I was playing the same exact thing before so I cannot let that happen 
So I still have to play, I mean, in honor of my sponsors and Complexity, so I still gotta represent. Yeah, the circle, but we're not really like super rivals. We're just like making fun of each other, but we're not really enemies or anything. We're just having fun because yeah. it's a game. But we have this, all of us have their, our, our own persona, how like the public perceives us. Like public perceives me as like, I'm really an asshole or I'm a douchebag, this and that. But if they really meet me in person, they would not think that. Like, I'm not so bad, but I have to pertain that role in the community that I'm the villain because that's my role. There's too many heroes already. A Microsoft is a hero. Like, Combo Fiend is a hero, right? Daigo is a hero, right? There's gotta be somebody who's gonna be the villain. Um, if you ever watched wrestling, there's a, there's a guy named John Cena. He's supposed to be like the face of wrestling. He's supposed to be a good guy, but the people hate him because supposedly he wins too much. Because one, he was a, he was the WWE champion for like three years straight. No one wants to see the person, the same person winning over and over and over again. Like I personally think I'm one of the nicest guys in the that you will ever meet or like a person that will always help you. But the people online, they have these amazing stories of me that I'm like some big asshole dick and I don't see why at all but if that's what the, that, and that's what my public image is to the stream monsters but you know the first time when someone knew me me the first thing they say is wow I thought I always thought you were a dick and I'm like yeah I get that a lot I you know like I'll be in a stream there'll easily be like 3,000 viewers all everybody just watching to see me lose at the end of the day, good or bad publicity is still publicity, so I win. I get sponsored because I have haters, so I don't care. But the only thing that matters to me is that the people that I love the most, like my friends, as long as they know who the real me is, that's all that matters to me. Like the random people, if I cared about everybody else and what they think about me, then I would not be playing at all. Um, so if people think that it's unfair for me to enter, you know what, Shang Tsung, Hey Hachi, you know, and Bison enter their own tournaments, why can't I enter mine? I think Alex just wanted to play in general. Like, Alex, he just likes to play. He just wants to, like, get the, the competition feel. It's a last minute. I mean, last minute entry with Justin. And we rarely team up together, you know what I mean? People call it, like, the, uh, I would say, um, a rift in time. Because, you know, I'm, I played in an era where I dominated. And then the, the only person remotely close that would I would call my successor would be Justin Wong. And he's pretty much outshined all of our old school players in the amount of tournament that he's played in. And uh, teaming up with him is just like, you know, is it fair? <laughs> you fought the rest, now try the best! each other but in my opinion uh, there needs to be more bad blood it's gonna force it no it's, it's, don't laugh I heard this from uh, Mike Watson it's gonna force people to play harder everyone is too 
too nice, too liberal, you know, all about high fives and hugging after matches when, no, there needs to be good old fashioned shit talk. And people need to get each other's faces and hate each other. This way they get it and they play harder, they play smarter. And not, you know, oh, I lost, okay, I'm just gonna, you know, go cry about in the corner. No, people need to get angry, people need to play harder. I talk shit back just because I want to get into Ricky Ortiz's hits team, you know? Like, I want to make them nervous and, like, it's, it's not going to affect me. So I touch, uh, talk trash back, and I know I was lucky, because I really got lucky. Uh, and it worked. It worked pretty well. Um, I only have ever won Mars Capcom 2 titles. That was my biggest titles, and I, I think I won six or seven of Marvel's Capcom 2 titles. The closest I ever got to another game was second place, which was second place in Street Fighter 3 Dirt Strike two times, and second place in Street Fighter 4. So I guess overall, like as the American player, I, I have the best ranking standards for Evolution. I guess my the best achievement was probably is winning Mars Capcom 2 the first time. I guess that's when everyone like started knowing who I was. And that's when I just kept going to more tournaments and I met more people and I met like, all my new friends because of winning that one tournament, because I took it more seriously after that. Justin Wong! Oh my god! Oh my god! I guess I don't, I, I always would rather just win anything in general. I like winning overall. Winning is always a fun thing. So winning Street Fighter would be cool, but I just rather win in anything that I, I compete in EVO. So if it's like any other game, I always still want to win. Anybody that gets addicted to competition, obviously a lot of games play on an element of competition and sort of being the best or, or defeating your opponents. Um, Street Fighter gets right in there with that uh, in a very deep way. And it's the kind of game that is, is, again, deep enough that you have a real investment into it. Like, you, you put yourself into the game. So when somebody beats you, uh, you know, in another game, I might laugh it off or something. Like, haha, you know, you beat me, whatever. I don't even really play this game. With Street Fighter, to play it on any kind of serious level, you can't do that. You're, you're invested in the game. You are in the game. So when they beat you, they're really... It's almost like a comment on your character or a comment on your brain or your understanding. Um, it hits personally. Uh, so I think the tournament level players are the guys that have made that kind of investment, have that bond with the game. Um, and then they have this this element of, you know, they don't take insults well, or they just, you know, for me, I just don't like losing. I don't even care about winning. I just hate losing. I was in the winner's bracket first. I had to fight, I fought KO and I lost to him. And I had to fight Rao. He was like the best Chun-Li in Japan at the time. And then I beat him in the mirror match with my Chun-Li and everyone was going crazy. When I was playing, I, I didn't really expect myself to make it that far in Street Fighter 3 Dirt Strike. I, I was like, oh wow, I got to this far. Because usually like Dirt Strike is like kind of like run by Japanese players. So there was like at least five Japanese players there. So they were expected to be to take top five easily. So I, I beat two of them already, and I was like, damn, you know, like this is kind of far. And then I was playing like Daigo. So it's a tense match. I believe it's the losers finals of the Street Fighter III Third Strike Tournament. And Justin has been dominating Daigo this round and has got Daigo, one of the strongest Japanese players, down to just a fraction of health. Rare footage of Daigo actually angry. I was doing really good. And then no one ever parried a super before. And they're sort of dancing back and forth from across the screen. And Daigo, uh, you know, sort of is holding his ground and dancing at this one particular distance. And Justin, you can tell, wants this match to be over and wants to close it out and win. And he knows he has the super bar stored up. So he can execute one of his super powered attacks, fly across the screen with a flurry of kicks. And the thing is, this attack is so strong, even if you hold away to block it, it'll still do a little bit of damage. And Daigo's health was so low that even this, he couldn't survive even this little bit of damage. Um, but in Street Fighter III, you've got this technique called parrying, where with precise timing, if you're able to tap forward at the exact moment that each attack strikes, you can completely deflect any damage. It won't hit you, 
it won't do a little bit of damage, it'll do nothing. So you're able to move again immediately as soon as you deflect the attack. So I believe there's 17 hits in Chun-Li's super, and uh, Daigo deflects them all in turn. And what's happening is the match unfolds, so Justin wants to close it out with that chip damage, but Daigo knows that Justin wants to wants to end the match. He's he's mentally wearing down. It's Even though he's got a huge advantage, he can tell Justin's tiring out, and he doesn't have a better strategy. He's got so little life that this is his best gamble. So he makes the gamble uh, that if he holds this distance, maybe Justin will just throw out the super, and he did. And obviously, it's extremely still difficult. Even if you know this is coming, it's extremely difficult to parry the super, but Daigo pulled it off brilliantly. He parries every hit of the super, and with every hit, you can hear the crowd go to sort of hush silence, and then the energy in the room starts to build as they sort of begin to slowly realize what he's doing, and is he actually going to be able to pull this off? Daigo pulls off the combo and it does just enough damage to kill Justin from his huge lead. And the crowd is just completely erupting. Um, and it was just one of those completely electric moments where not only was it a sort of a high stakes tense match, but also sort of a brilliant encapsulation of what's possible if you're able to read the mind of your opponent. And I was like, damn, that was pretty good. Like, because that was like my first year of taking Dirt Strike seriously. So I didn't expect him to do it. So I kind of learned a lot from him doing that. And I was like, oh, that was cool. <laughs> That's what I thought. Okay, uh, that made me want to get better in third strike and try to win next year. And then I was pretty close winning the year after that because I got second and I was supposed to, and I was like almost there because it was one match away, like one round away. It was the final round, final match and everything. Uh, and also this sort of passion play again of, of these two guys, you know, Justin just wanting to close out this win against this great Japanese player and seeing he's just sort of dancing it's just just out of reach for him where he can almost grab the win but and Daigo knows you want to grab it and it's just out of reach for you so he's able to use that to predict what Justin's going to do next and uh, that's that was that was it in a nutshell just knowing exactly what's going to be in the mind of your opponent and then having the skills to, to counter that and make a, a brilliant comeback and such a great reaction from the crowd because they all understood and respected exactly what was going on. Well, I'm waiting in line because pre-registration is, I mean, Evo was let me think of some numbers. Last year, Street Fighter 4 was 2,000 people for just Super 4. So we're talking, you know, five, 6,000 total entrants or something. So at this point, you know, we're just going to be waiting in line for hours. Remember, if people are using wireless PlayStation 4s. No, no, no. DualShock or 6 axis, not allowed. Yeah. As we say, doors are open. Oh, and they all just come in. So. It'll be a sea of people. It'll be a very good thing to capture, actually. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing okay. I didn't get a whole lot of sleep last night. Jittery. I'm also a little 
worry that's going to affect my performance. And that's basically just the very, very, very beginning. We're talking over 2,000 entrants, so I've probably got about 15, 17 more to go before I win the whole thing. Uh, everyone's here just to do their best. We all paid to come out. They all have nerves to deal with. Uh, most of these people live in small areas and they don't have regular competition. So a lot of them are here to learn. You could pick up 90% of the games on the shelf at GameStop, take it home, never look at the instruction manual, put it in, and it'll teach you how to play, right? But fighting games don't really do that. They don't teach you how to play. And when they try, they usually fall on their face trying. Uh, Street Fighter Force challenge modes were awesome for like veteran players, but they didn't teach you know, people why these things work and why they should do them. They didn't teach people how to block, how to move, you know, the basic stuff that you have to know to compete. And it gives people the wrong idea. There's too many players who think that being good means landing a cool combo, but that's not really what it's about. That's, that's the last building block. The rest of it below that, if it's not sturdy, you can't win. And the games are not teaching you that. So it falls upon the community to lend a hand to newer players and say, we'll teach you because we want you to stay. We're only as strong as our best. So we need to bring in more people so we can have more best, so we can all get strong. First match is always the most tense, I'll tell you. It's always, always. You got me? If you, if you are a competitor, there's something in here that can't be quelled where you want to be better than everyone else. That's just how it is. Very, very few people come out to compete for fun. Most of us are here with the intention to either win or get as far as we can. But you can't take those losses in a way where you forget why you lost. You have to be aware enough and clear enough to know that when you step away from a loss, you can take the lessons with it as well. That way it's not a total loss. The lessons are your, are your prize. Um, if you want to win, you should take the rules available and manipulate them into your favor. Cheap is a, has a positive connotation to me. To some of the newer players, cheap has a negative connotation. I believe that being cheap is the goal. That usually involves taking options away from your opponent which is how you win. But the opponent will often cry cheap and say, you know, that's not fair. Uh, why are you throwing me? I'm blocking and I shouldn't be taking any damage. You threw me. Yeah, uh, throws are cheap. Uh, the guy complaining is a scrub. The game is fair because we both have the same options at the character select stream. And once those choices are made, everything else is fair game because you made, you made the choice. You chose the bad character, you know. It's not cheap that this character is better than yours or that it has a bad matchup. But I believe that fairness ends at the character select screen. So in a fighting game, you have different characters and these characters are not created equal. If they were, we would be playing Karate Champ and we would be all very, very bored. So what you're looking at is players trying to accurately figure out which characters are the best and which are the worst. And they call this a tier list. The top tier is the best character in the game. They have the most natural advantages and or the most good matchups. So you'll see like a matchup chart in which it scores each character against the others, saying, oh, this character in a set of 10 will win seven and the other character will win three, so he has an advantage. And because of this and this and this factor, he's a better choice. So using the tier lists, people start to think, oh, I have no choice. I have to pick the best characters if I want to win. And that just isn't true. There, are, there will always be tiers in any competitive game, but the player makes, can make any character like viable in tournament. The players are still winning, and the evidence is all over the place. You know, character gets nerfed, player sticks with character, player still wins. It's just you need to you need to improve yourself. That's all you have to do. You know, you just throw Hadoukens all day, and if I jump at you, you sure you can. Nah, you're cheap. That guy's a scrub. He doesn't understand, or he's not playing to win is the problem. You know, and he's not. Uh, he's he's got some mental constructs up in his head, some rules that are made up that are telling him the way the game works. But that's not the way the game works. The way the game works is programmed in the code, and he can't change that, you know what I mean? So, that's, yeah, scrubs just don't get it. They just don't know. It's not cheap that I can do these tactics, because you could have picked the character and done them too. You have to take all the advantages available to you if you're a serious competitor and you want to win. It's not about staying true to your character. It's not about, you know, being fair or tear whoring. It's just about winning. It's competition. It's about winning. We're all here to improve and win. I played CVS too, and I'm not feeling the same. One more mix up. Second 
Yeah, that's my second one. Oh, really? Fuck you! Sorry. There's a pickle on the floor, there's trash everywhere. Um, it's kind of a dilapidated setting, isn't it? Uh, I just lost to Big Marcus. Big Marcus is uh, probably the best bison in the Midwest. I've spent a lot of time on the bison matchup and it really pisses me off that I couldn't beat him. So I have a loss now. One more loss and I'm out. This place shall become your grave! Um, I need to make sure I don't lose again. Uh, right now I'm a little ticked off, but uh, I'm going to channel that energy for the next match. Eventually, you're going to get sat down next to someone who you overly respect. You know, they're going to say a name like, let's just say, you have to play Mike Ross. And you know this name. You don't, you don't know the guy. You never met him. You never played him. You just know the myth. And you've seen his accolades. And suddenly you feel like you're this big. And you're not playing the way you want to play or the way you need to play to beat a player like that. Getting over those feelings and realizing that a Justin Wong or a Mike Ross are beatable people. They're human beings, they have weaknesses, they can be exploited. Realizing that is so hard, but so important. It's Latif running uh, Viper. I feel like Latif is one of the strongest players in the country. Couldn't agree more. We he, just he saw the SBO qual. He was beat everybody. dominant. He did not lose a, a game but what, at SBO qual. Will he know what to do up against Sony here? This is going to be a very interesting this strategy a, by uh, Ryan. Crazy, uh, Ryan blocking ah, for yeah. his life. Game one in pretty convincing fashion. There I think team. we can guarantee a character switch here unless I'm looking for it. Yeah. Ryan is uh, really going to shock me here. But in two out of three action, I think he's got to go back to that select screen, and here we go. And he is. And he he is. Uh, decided on the wrong character pick in the tournament when I chose Oni against PJS Latif. And in a best of three, it's critical to get the first game. You know, it can be, psychologically anyway. Now he's put himself in a corner, but Yoon, obviously, very, very strong. Ryan, smart player, nice read there. Latif again, going back to oh, this game. Oh, oh okay, okay. I into like the, the grab. Oh, he does not complete. Oh, wow, a perfect. Dominant round from Ryan, and he's going to be in perfect position to land that Ganajin into round three. Of course, still match point Latif. And it's real hard to deal with the Yun who has that kind of uh, meter built up because it means, as Latif, you're just going to be more worried about taking risks than even you, you normally are. And again, if you can get that shoulder check pressure going, oh, maybe a little miscalculation there. Well, I definitely don't like testing Latif's reactions. I feel like he's got some of the best in the biz. Oh, here's a big chance! All right, into meaty pressure. Oh, oh well. into nothing, though. Again, burning that meter just there there. Blown up on the back dash. Boy, Broken I really... Tier Latif. I really wish Ryan Hart had not gone to Oni because I would have loved to have seen two, at least two games of that. I feel like he would have done much better. It, it could have been interesting. Yeah, I feel like his Yun was so much stronger. We'll fucking beat him then. Just box. Wait, he gets a lot of flack that he look, kind of looks like you. No. You, you, think, you think so? <laughs> I think, it's okay. I think, you don't. I think there's a resemblance. I, I think there's like a resemblance. <laughs> you look like me. Yeah. yeah. Even though it's like the <laughs> <laughs> You'll notice a lot of players now wear headphones or noise-canceling headphones. Uh, and the reason they do that is to drown out the crowds. Um, and uh, in my case, I like the hype. I enjoy getting in the groove, so to speak, swaying back and forth. I enjoy the emotions of the moment, and I allow them to affect my decisions because I think that when I'm emotional about the game, and I think that when I am in the moment, I think that I do better. A student of the game, yeah. and he's going up against uh, John Flores Erickson from Daly City, California. Don't know that guy. Yep, and it looks like um, Erickson is going to go with Dalson, which um, very early on in the lifespan of Street Fighter 4, when I was playing local tournaments in Arizona, I realized very quickly that I became my heart started to race in the middle of matches, especially when I was about to lose. And when I did lose, it would it would come as a tremendous shock to me and. You know, I felt like I can always do better, I can always do better, and it, 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 it's just like a, a big torrent of emotion that I felt. And it, what happens is I get full of adrenaline, I'm full of energy, and I, I, I don't know what to do with it, so I start to fidget. I start to move, I start to sway, I start to... It, it's partly an outlet for my energy because I'm honestly high as I play. Uh, I mean, not medically speaking, but I just, I feel that way. and. Uh, and the thing about ultras is that they last like 10, 15 seconds. Right. But these guys, Bison and Abel, they have that long, long range dash, and that's, that makes it good for them. Oh. And we've got 
Uh oh, somebody hit a PlayStation button in here. What's it, John? Run the video back and check. It's going to say it on the top right which controller was used, and then have them check. It's not going to matter. As soon as they hit the home button, it's paused. It'll say who caught you. Who, which oh, controller oh yeah, I'll try it out. Yeah, because that's what you can't, it's hard to tell on the PS3 though, right? No, 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 it, no, it tells up there. It's paused. The it'll, it'll take away that, but keep the game paused. It'll show who paused it. What control if, it paused. if it was one of those. Yeah, yeah. Xbox pressed it. What does he want to do? Situation. A lot of times players, when they run into the situation, will just kind of agree to move on from where they are, and they're not too worried about it. Well, he's clearly done. Like, come on. Like. Two rules are whoever paused the game, Loses that round. The thing is, it's not very clear who pauses it. Well, you, you can't tell. The nice thing is right now, you... Oh, That's a lie, dude. It yeah, only actually, it just says when one player paused. When pause, you hit the home key, yeah, it always it just goes says to one player pause. pause. That's, right. that's total lie from uh, Street Fighter 4 yeah. right now. If you hit Trolling the start us. button, it'll tell you which one it exactly. is. But if you hit the home button, it always says one player Yeah, pause. so it's it's not exactly discernible who who right. is at fault here. If it's one of the two players, if it's some other random person with a wireless controller and right. out in the cloud. We're so not it looks like totally we're sure. going to try to figure it out right now. Uh -huh. uh, we have some judges on stage right now. You can uh, see the judges right now blocking the view of the camera. Take the round or let it play out. Unless you make your decision, you can't go back on it. Excuse me? I'll take it out. Okay. So he's playing it out? No, he's taking the round. Taking the round, okay. So, um, yeah, we will figure this out. We'll get this sorted out in just a little bit and get back to the matchup. And he's just going to grab him. Oh, and it stunned him anyway, so it's not going <laughs> to... Well, it looks like it's not going to make any difference anyway. He should have just, just finished the round, right? Just, I mean, come just on. Him. What? What are you talking about? Oh, they, oh, but you know what? Maybe, I know. I mean, it was all... I guess they're going to give the round to the round of you? Anyway. Yeah. Whatever, all right. I, I mean... There is a rule called the inevitable outcome. Dude, I would be so bad if I was juice box right now. Oh my Are god. Are you kidding me? I know he fell blow on him and he's dead. Throw. Yeah, I know. That's very unfortunate. Yeah, yeah we all saw it. I got too excited and I hit the guide button on my stick. But when you pause the game like that, uh, we try to be sort of lenient with the rules, but as far as you know trying to take this more professionally, a pause can ruin someone's concentration, it can ruin the moment. In that case, I would have won if I didn't pause. Say, um, so here's the idea. He's allowed to take the round if he wants, or he's allowed to simply unpause the game and allow us to play it out from that instant. First of all, like you can restart the game, but if I, if I had won a round, what happens to that round? And let's say we did restart it, and I won a round right away, I would have all this meter, and he wouldn't because I'm kicking his ass in order to get that round. See what I'm saying? And the meter can be very important in matchups. Take, for example, Guile and Sagat. They're both chucking EX Plasma all day because if they can't, they, you know, it's, it's very important to the matchup. So meter, meter's important. So because of that, they can't discard the rounds that have happened. So they just give him a round and they give him the meter is basically what the current ruling is. Or he can simply unpause and allow us to play it out. And he took the round, which I suppose I would have done anyway. I can't blame him for that. But fortunately for me, I won anyway, so. But now, the funny thing about Mad Cat Sticks is there's a lock switch. See the lock? Mine was unlocked. When this is locked, you can't hit turbo, you can't hit guide, you can't hit start or select. So because mine was unlocked, I was like... <laughs> like, this basically is what happened. <laughs> I got too excited, so... I'll... Tournament players, lock your goddamn sticks. Well, the last match I played, obviously I was in loser's bracket. Um, I was playing against Tokido. Flash Metroid, BLG Juice Box, up against Tokido. Tokido, the murder face. And he's going with uh, with a jury. With both of these guys, two of the most theatrical guys in all of Street Fighter. That's true. Uh, what Tokido is, uh, as far as I know, best uh, Kuma player in the world. I don't really think of anyone else as being better than him. Uh, and uh, I was not going to play Able against him. I learned at Revelations against Infiltration that. A very good Akuma player is not going to need to work very hard to be an able player, regardless of skill level. Um, there's a lot of things going on in that match that are just not under able's control. Still in there. Oh, that could be good. No. Akuma. Watch the second hit hit. There that it was is. It. He was Akuma. that far away. That second just hit. Just in time. What Coast a nail be. biter. Coast the jury burns be. your meter. Very unfortunate. But what a. Oh wow. That was some tricky stuff. Did not pay off there. This time, Juice Box blocks it all. Oh no, this no, is gonna not be that big. one. Wow. Okay. Tell your cross up, talk to my foot. 
And again, that teleport, uh, very tough for Jury to deal with. Hard to keep that sustained pressure, but again, that's not especially Jury's game. And there Ultra is! Two. Jumping strong, Ultra 2. It's time for some tricks. You watch the dance. Act it out, baby. Taquito, you like some, uh, you like Look dancing around? Oh, he's him. got his Taquito's hands watching him. Look, this could be it. Evolution 2011. What's it going to be for Juice Box? Oh, opportunity. Knocks him down. Just walking forward. What a casual walk. Unfortunately, her walk speed is not that Jump fast. There it is. The Juice strong. Box goes home, and Tokido makes it into top eight. MCZ Tokido moving on. And you see what I mean. He's At the same time, Juice Box is uh, very pleasant about his loss. He takes it extremely to heart. Yeah. Against Tokido, I think I did well. Um, there were quite a few reads that I missed, and he got a few good trips off on me. Um, he got in my head just a little bit. Um, but I do believe that he beat me more as a player, and he didn't beat Jury the character as much as I thought he would. And I think that uh, he doesn't have a, a great amount of experience with that matchup, and so I think that if I play him again in a tournament in the future, um, I will have improved. I won't be making those, those tiny mistakes that allowed him to take the, the rounds from me, and uh, I'll, I think I'm probably going to beat him next time due to strength of matchup. Um, of course, it's all wishful thinking in the end, but... Uh, I, uh, I mean, I respect him. He beat me fair and square. And there's no other way to win in this game. Uh, and uh, I'm happy that I got to play him on such a big stage. And uh, I'm happy that people got to see my jury, really. Um, and uh, I'm really just happy to get ninth place, which is what I got after losing to him. And now he's in top eight. Well, I'm pretty emotional right now, actually. Uh, I'll be honest, I didn't really expect to get this far. Um, yeah, um, I didn't think my jury would be as good as it was. I didn't think I'd give Tokido a run for his money. I mean, I didn't win, but I feel oddly uh, really content right now. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm just really happy that I got this far, and I think next year I'm going to get further. In winner's bracket, we have Daigo, Punko, Fudo, and Latif. And in loser's bracket, we have Flash Metroid, Kindebu, Wolf Crone, and Tokido. Latif is on a tear right now. He's probably America's best chance right now, I would say. It's funny, that are, the Americans are, are Viper, Viper, and Zangief. I wonder if we're going to see a Daigo Punko final, because I think a lot of people really want to see that, actually. So. If anybody, I think, has an amazing shot against him, I think it's Punko. He's got the skills to beat absolutely anybody in the world. I wasn't sure he had the skills to go the tournament distance because he takes so many chances, but he's made it here, and let's see what Daigo has to say about this. All right, everybody's been waiting for this matchup. Let's go! Let's get into it. Evolution 2011 World Finals. Let's see if Punko is not immune to nerves. Oh, wow. Daigo oh. saying, I can smell you're a little bit off here. Nice, there's the randomness there's the from punch. Pungo. Oh, he baits it out. Great try. Beat says Pungo. Round one to the Korean kid. And he dropped it there. Almost facing the focus attack. Oh, I wow. notice. Smart focus is predicting that Pierce gets in there, not able to do any damage. Who dashes forward and uppercuts dive kicks? I'll tell you who. <laughs> His name is Puko. You may have heard of him here at the Evolution 2011 World Oh, Finals. great bait! Great bait! And he is all over the beast here. This is unbelievable. Oh! Dizzy! He's going to be dizzy very soon. Okay, I, never mind. I think they may have really styling. Stop, 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 dive. What's going to be? Oh! Up. Yep. He is working on a perfect against Daigo in the heart of the beast. Good cross off and another brilliant read from Puko. This is unprecedented. We can no, I the day. This is gonna be it. A perfect Puko with a perfect knocking Daigo into losers bracket. Blowing up the 
beast. We have never seen a beating like that in Daigo history. Wow, people picking him up, his crew, cheering him on. It seems as though the tournament is already over, judging by the reaction. This is the craziest. <laughs> I have never seen anything like that before. I've never seen Daigo so fundamentally dominated and so carefully read. He, he didn't just get blown up by all of Puko's good guesses. Puko baited out Daigo's own bad guesses. Right. And that is a scary thing. And so you you're know, losing on both sides. Yeah, I mean, the fun, the, the, the best part about it is you're saying, like, I mean, that's the best way to describe it. Like, Punko made all the right guesses. But at that point, when he made so many correct ones in a row, you can't call them guesses anymore. They're reads now. <laughs> if I had talked to you 15 years ago and said, in 10 years, you're going to turn on ESPN2 and watch poker, watch people play cards, you would say, get out of here. You're an idiot. That's never going to happen. And now that's such a reality. And so many people who never thought they would enjoy it watch it because it's presented well. And if you watch the stream, you'll obviously see the same thing here. This is presented well, it's made easy to understand, it's innately easy to understand, and if our cards are played right over the next couple of years, we could experience the same explosion that poker experienced. For me, the best compliment I think I ever had was actually when somebody said we were sitting around watching um, you know, a Street Fighter tournament at my local poker game, and my dad walked in and he was like, what are you bunch of fairies watching? And you know, so some, something nasty to the, to the guys. And uh, they would explain, oh, it's Street Fighter. And then by the, end of the, by the end of the night, their dad was sitting there cheering and rooting for the Street Fighter players, just like everybody else. Um, he'd, he'd been drawn in just by the explanations that were happening uh, on camera. And so if that's possible, that makes me pretty excited about the future. Um, and uh, again, the reactions to Evo 2011 were, were really strong, that same kind of thing. I, you know, I don't watch fighting games or I don't watch competitive gaming at all, um, but I watched this and I, I had a great time or I was thrilled. So to me, that's, that's the sign that we're, we're all doing our jobs and um, maybe, there's, maybe there's a chance for this thing. The first year that streams came onto the scene, when they got a thousand people watching at the same time, they were like, we got a thousand people, we're the best, oh my God. Right? That sounds like a joke now. Evo came and did their stream for the first year. And the year after that, all of the streams at the majors were getting like three to 5,000 during their finals. And they were like, oh my god, we're incredible, three to 5,000. Then Evo did another stream. And for the entire year after that, which was this year, the majors were almost all getting between 12 and 18,000 simultaneous viewers during their peak times. That's a huge jump. That's way bigger than the jump of the first year. So with Evo last year getting about 55,000 simultaneous and the subsequent streams hitting around 18, I was hoping this year we'd get like 100 at Evo and hopefully next year all the majors are getting 30 to 50,000 during their finals. That's my hope. You see, uh, Excuse me, uh, Pluto. You see uh, Latif breathing out heavily right now. You can tell he's really trying to focus, but you know, He's still working on a perfect here with 67 seconds left. Good basic mix up now at Puma. Here he comes. Getting the teeth cornering himself. I don't know if I like that. Nice, nice play there. And it's really interesting because the U.S. crowd has taken the Tokido very well. They love him. But right now, they are all very much rooting against him. Right now, he is the enemy. And Latif is our last chance for an American player to stay in this tournament. Oh, he got him. He got him. And there's and the stun! Go he's got to complete this. This is the combo of his life. Oh my gosh, he's still there! And Latif! Look at you, Latif! Tokido, the murder face! He takes it from Tokido! Tokido has been eliminated! Score one for you, The moves on these guys' faces, watching their faces as they play the game. Um, there's so much heart in so many of these matches and so many hours of investment, personal investment, um, wanting to represent your country and your friends and your local scene as well as yourself well to the world and maybe it's your career, maybe you just have that kind of passion, whatever it is for you. Um, there's so much energy and uh, yeah, just passion poured out onto the stage. That's what made it electric um, and it was coming from, from a lot of different sides. Um, I like Cody a lot because he has an attitude that's kind of similar to mine. Um, I haven't been in prison, but Cody lives in prison, which I would call my house. And once in a while, he breaks out and goes and fights some people because it's fun. 
It's what he likes to do. That's what I like to do too. I leave my house and I go out to an event, get in some street fights, <laughs> not literally, and uh, then I go home and I go back to go back to my little jail. And uh, his attitude about it is kind of like, I'm bored. Fighting is fun for me. It makes me feel alive. The competition makes me feel alive. Even if I'm not the best, I'm trying to be. And when I'm playing, you know, my heart moves at a rate that it doesn't normally. And my senses act differently. It's just, you know, it's good. Oh, Daigo was trying to do something that isn't really possible in today's Street Fighter world, and that's three-peat and Evo. The reason that's not possible in today's world is twofold. The first is the game has changed. The games used to be much more consistent, now they're all built with a comeback factor that makes them a lot more inconsistent in the results. The best players almost always still win, but it's harder to be consistent. The other factor is the size of the community. Winning year to year, a uh, 200 to 300 man tournament back to back, it's a lot easier than winning a 1,500 man tournament back to back to back, right? It's just, it's too long a tournament, too many things can go wrong for you. Hunko pretty much exposed Daigo's inexperience against Seth and put him away, made amazing reads. And then Latif put him away in losers, but it was very, very well fought on both sides. Take a look at this bracket here if you can. I want to point out to you that Latif here in the loser's bracket, after losing the Fudo, beat Takedo, then he beat Daigo, and then he beat Punko. That is the most ridiculous thing, you know? And, you know, once, right when it started, Wolf Chrome lost, Flash Metroid lost, so US is like, uh, and then Latif lost, and we're like, uh, and then he goes and beats Tokido, Daigo, and Punko, gets to the grand finals, and I mean, like, seriously, like, You'd almost think that we scripted it. I think it's a wake-up call for everyone who's been down on themselves because of where they live or, or how good the competition is. That could be you up there, man, you know? Daigo's not unbeatable. No one's unbeatable. Daigo is a two-time champion. He's great. But there are other players of his caliber all over the world, and there have been for a long time, but now everyone knows him. Oh, Trading rush punches there for a moment. There's that frame trap off of the wreck. That's the built-in frame trap. Oh no. Latif allowing himself to get pushed back in the corner and guessing throw. And that was just a horrible... I, I, I don't like that because I feel like you can risk the throw in that situation. Whereas the other option is death. It's not effective. Oh, frame trap. That's not going to combo. Oh! Once again, catching the EX side mode. Losing to the invincibility before it hits. And Fudo was able to take that, and now Fudo is at game. He's at tournament, he's at championship, championship game. Championship point, one of the biggest fields in competitive history at Evolution 2011. And the crowd trying to pump Latif up right now. You can see them right now all over the place. They're cheering, they're raising their hands, they're pumping their fists. They're getting there. Getting to their feet. Oh, there he is. He's reading those neutral jumps again, and I'd like to see something other than just the burn kick blank mix up. That jump, neutral jump is a good tactic against Rekkas, but. Not if was... there are no Rekkas coming, yeah, of course. Exactly. Oh no! That could be. Oh! oh Brilliant read! Brilliant read for the team for staying alive. My heart stopped. But right that is there. only the second round, James. Oh my god. Our hearts must continue to beat. He can and he drops it. PJ Latif's tournament life right here. And he just runs away. Options out of it, and now he's cornered himself. I do not like this from Latif. He had his chance. No! Oh! Oh! Crazy attempt. He went for the glory, and Fudo from Japan. Your Evolution 2011. Let's do it together. Your Evolution 2011, 2011 champion, Fudo! I was overhyped. That got into my head a little bit. Uh, I didn't do well in the grand finals and I lost like 3-0, winning all the way Uh 
Fudo was definitely a great, great challenge, great player. Uh, he deserved it. And uh, no one managed to beat him at all, so he definitely earned it. Congrats to him. It's the power of the players um, and their belief in the game and their belief in themselves and each other that creates uh, these incredible crowd reactions and incredible um, displays from each of them. It's all about the enjoyment for me. Like I said earlier, it's not really to do with money. It's, it is more about the, the, the enjoyment, the, the fun, the pleasure of just doing what I enjoy doing. On the one hand, the, the sort of punk in me doesn't care uh, what anybody else thinks of Evo. Like, I know what's in that room, and the people in that room know what's in that room. And we will always share that, and that's our thing. And I would love it if the world were to wake up and understand what we do, but I don't care. Um, I will push to make it happen, but if we put it in front of people and they're too stupid to understand, uh, that doesn't to me decrease the value of what's happening in that room one bit. Uh, I think it matters, it matters a lot, but I'm gonna be working really hard to make sure the world gets its chance to understand exactly what's happening in that room because I think it's not just one of the best things in esports or games or anything like that. I think it's one of the best things straight up in the world. Fudo was incredible. Every time somebody wanted to move, Fudo's character was already there. The fist was already there. He got himself out of dangerous situations safely. He just, he played the smartest of everyone. The community and respect is gonna be there for him, but there's gonna be this lingering, like, thought. He didn't beat Daigo, right? Latif and Kunko beat Daigo. Fudo didn't beat Daigo. So maybe he's not the best, maybe it was a fluke. And that's gonna be around for a while. What makes people care about Street Fighter is not the action on the screen, it's the action off screen, it's the action between two players, it's the investment these guys have in the game, which is obvious. So that same investment I always talk about is, you know, their heart's on their sleeve, um, they're going for it, this is, it's all on the line. And that whole arcade culture that's been there since the beginning of EVO really sort of is, it's all about that. It's about respecting it. It's about embracing it. It's about celebrating it and not being ashamed of that this is a game or whatever because that passion is real. Yeah.